that according. Um, so the because that's the qualitative analysis, basically, we don't have numbers for column chromatography for those of you who watched the video already. And if you have not watched it, I'm telling you now that there is no numerical value for column chromatography. But the numerical values for uh, for the, uh, let me ask someone instead of me answering it, what data should go to the data table for TLC, for thin layer chromatography, what data? should be included, could you tell me? RF values, um, RF values, that's that's part of the calculation, actually. Um, the actual data, the distance traveled, distance traveled for what? Traveled for, for solvent, and then the distance traveled by each of the samples, or the distance traveled for anything that shows up on TLC. So you need one for solvent and one for each spot. Very good. Um, so when you have those uh, numbers, that that goes into the table. If you want to include the include the RF values, that's okay. That's perfect. What but is needed is those four items: the distance traveled by solvent and other um, samples. And then underneath, you would show your calculation how to calculate the RF values. And you also, um, I also want you to, to submit two images. One is the TLC image that I took it from the, uh, the UV lamp, like from the UV lamp but while it was under the UV lamp. And the other one is when I have the three flask on the desk, um, on the bench, and I am, I am um, just showing that uh, the, the color, how it should be of course one is like color one should be colorless one should be colored and the other one should be um, no color also so um, if it's like a light yellow it shows that it's impure or some of the fluoronone has been lost so that i think answers the questions if there's any questions that i missed let me know so i would answer it before i go over the experiment with you um you can paste the screenshot yes there's the image already um you take his you take the the picture and you reduce the size whatever in a way that it doesn't take the entire lab report so you would in, insert it as an image yes uh let me just make sure I didn't miss any questions. If I did miss questions, please say it. Or um, no questions? Do we include the screenshots in the lab report? Yes, if it tell, if it tells you take a screenshots in the PDF file um, as the the screenshots in the um, lab report include the pictures as the PDF. Um, the, the, those two are not the only images. You can include them in both sides, but as that it uh, that those two is part of the report, and there are other images also that you need to take and um, and submit it as a PDF. And if you want to include these two in both places, is all right. But the picture, especially with the with the Column chromatography, that counts as a data, but is a qualitative analysis data, just like solubility that um, you had the, the table. So, uh, the TLC plate, as long as you have the numbers, the TLC plate, it could be. I mean, I, I think I asked you to put in the in the report, the TLC plate and the other one as the separate PDF. OK, you can you can use that as the PDF, but the, the column chromatography, it has to be in the in the report. Okay. So TLC plate, because you have the numbers, OK, you have the numbers, it's OK. As long as you have the table, it's okay not to show it, but you show that in the PDF file. 
column chromatography yes yes column chromatography is the data is a major finding is the data thank you okay um what is chromatography tell me what is chromatography What's the chromatography? What is chromatography and what is application for chromatography? Chromatography is a separation based on the difference in polarity. Uh, very good, Ashana, between the molecules. Okay. And the application for chromatography? What are the applications for chromatography? Is separation the only application for chromatography? Separation of very small uh, samples, okay? It's non-invasive. You don't have to have a bulk of the sample. You could have one drop of the sample and you could still do the, uh, do the chromatography. And um, what's the other application for chromatography? You do only separation or can you also do identification? Okay. Identification, yes, mostly used in the forensics, yes, sciences as well. Identification and separation, or separation and identification. Um, can someone, uh, I keep in mind who has answered the questions and who has not. Okay, I see you. I was actually looking for email. Uh, so could you tell me how the separation is, how the identification is done in chromatography? What information do you need in order to identify an unknown? Or how the identification part is done with the, using chromatography? The samples are placed on TLC plate and see how much the solvents travel and the sample travel and then what? Okay, matching DRF value based on known samples. So you have to do the TLC. So Sammy, what you're referring is the part of the experiment. But when you get the data, you, you have the RF value for your sample. You must have RF value for known samples that it's possible or potential sample or identity for your compound so when you have the two when you have the pool like two or three compounds and you have your unknown you are going to match the rf value for for your unknown to the each sample and whichever is the same is going to be uh, identity for your compound so rf value of the unknown is compared to the RF value of known samples or known possible samples that could be your unknown, and you can um, you can um, separate it or you can uh, you can identify it. Now, could you tell me this separation in chromatography is based on what? How does the separation takes place? What is based on? Can we separate anything? Any two compounds based on the difference in polarity of the sample and the unknown or, or the samples. So the spots that you are putting on the TLC plate, if they have different polarity, they are going to absorb a different rate to the stationary phase. And 
they are going to travel with different speed. And if they travel different speed at a given time, they are going to travel different distance. But the base goes back to the difference in polarity. So if we have a different polarity for these compounds, then we have the uh, different uh, polarity in the compound. Then you have the uh, the discrimination between the compounds by stationary phase and also mobile phase. So for TLC, we are stationary phase is the coat, the thin coat that is on the support plate. The plate is plastic. The white coating that is on the TLC plate is actually count as a stationary phase. If that is a polar compound, then you have compounds, samples. Let me bring the diagram. So if the, um, if the stationary phase here is this white coating that you have on the plate is polar, then you have your samples, the three samples that is spotted in there, they have different polarity, so they must have different polarity. And then you bring your solvent, the solvent is going to move up on the TLC plate by capillary action. And when it goes up, then your sample has a choice to move up with the solvent or stay longer and interact for longer time with the, with the plate or with the coating on the plate or a stationary phase. And as a result, if it starts interacting, and that interacting is based on, um, as I think Tarek said, is based on adsorption. It's just like the 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 and this interaction is on the surface of the sample, and the, so it doesn't get soaked in. It's just on the surface action on the surface. So if the sample is polar, and your plate also is polar, the coating on the plate is polar is going to have more interaction and it wants to stay with the stationary phase. It doesn't want to move. Uh, then your solvent is trying to, to force it up. But the compounds that they have no, the samples that they have no interaction with the stationary phase, they are going to move up faster. And as a result, they are going to travel longer distance. So what is a good solvent? A good solvent for TLC. What type of solvent is going to be good solvent? What is not a good solvent? Okay, I'm going to use solvent A. Okay, after I run the TLC, all the spots are going to stay right here in this level in level A. Is that would that be a good solvent? If all the spots are on the same level. That's not going to be a good solvent, right? So a good solvent is the solvent that would uh, separate them vertically. So each sample should travel with different distance or different speed. If the solvent is very strong, very aggressive, is going to to move them all with the same distance. And uh, if it's if it's very weak, is not going to move anything, and all of them would stay at where they were. So your solvent, in terms of the polarity, can be changed. You could use mixture of solvents. But the, the person who's designing the experiment has to do most of the work. They have to find out what's the perfect solvent for this separation, what, which solvent or what ratio of mixture of solvent is going to give you the best separation. You see, the separation must be vertical and horizontal. I mean, if you have if you have if the separation is not horizontal you don't have these spaces between the spots it's very hard to identify the compound if they are not separated by vertically then also you would get same rf and if you get same rf same rf means same compound so it, your identification it would be wrong in this case 
the figure 5-1, it shows a unknown that is a mixture of the two. Let's say if you have, if this is a caffeine and that is acetaminophen, you have excedrin. Excedrin is a mixture of caffeine and acetaminophen, so it's going to show two spots. If your compound is not, your unknown is not a mixture, it would show only one spot. And that one spot, it could be aligned with the compound on the right side or with the left side, and you identify your unknown. If you see multiple uh, spots, that means your unknown is a mixture of multiple items. If your unknown, let's say, comes up to this level very high, and none of the known samples is going to move there, that means you don't have enough known samples, so your unknown is not any of the known samples, then you have to try adding more possible compounds to the plate. But if it's a mixture, it would show multiple, multiple spots. Um, there's a question in the pre-lab that it says, what happens if the sample runs over the plate? If you forget to stop the um, development and the, the, the solvent, it goes over the top. What would be the problem with that? You will not get accurate. RF value, we cannot interpret what the compound is. Accurate RF value. Okay, the accurate RF value, that is um, why we don't have accurate RF value. Because we don't have a number for denominator, right? We don't know the, the distance traveled by solvent. And if you don't know the distance traveled by solvent, it doesn't matter how accurate is the distance traveled by each sample, you don't have a a uh, reliable number to divide by, so you can't use the, those RF values. What happens if what happens if um, you use the so too much solvent? Basically, the depth of the solvent now is below the sample, right? You have the depth of the solvent right here below the sample. What happens if the depth depth of the solvent moves up if you get the solvent line here what would be problem with that and i hope that people who have not students who have not answered they start answering because i don't want to you know run out of questions and you don't get a chance to answer i don't want only two three or four people to answer these questions i want everyone in class to answer even if you think that someone is going to answer before you, you type in. Okay, what's going to happen in that case is that uh, is basically the sample is going to wash wash out. They are going to dissolve in the in the uh, solvent. So now you have a solution. You don't have a solvent moving up. You have a solution. Of course, your sample is in the um, is in the solution so when it moves up it's going to separate and and it shows you different layers okay it might be one one could happen right here one could move up here and the other one could move up there uh, but but um, horizontally there is no separation and if horizontally there is no separation, so you don't know which sample moved up to point A and which sample moved up to point B because you have a line. So basically, um, it's there's no no horizontal separation. So you want the separation to be vertical and horizontal. So you have to follow the proper technique to have a proper separation. If your solvent is not good. You may not have vertical separation. If you you use improper depth of the solvent, then you don't have horizontal separation, and you won't be able to. That's one problem. The other problem is that you're going to get a uh, um, diluted sample, and if the sample is diluted, identification is going to be hard as well. 
Okay. So when you develop the sample, I mean the 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 chamber, you are going to stop when it's about like one inch. Oops, it's not moving. Is about one inch from the top. You're going to stop, dry your sample, take it to um, to UV lamp, and uh, under the UV, the spots are going to shine, and you will see that. And you can you can see the you can see that uh, the how the travel distance by each of the uh, sample and the unknown. By compare, calculate you calculate the RF first, and then you compare. And sometimes it's very easy because it's everything happens at the same plate to see what's the distance traveled by each of the um, compound and the unknown. Oh, okay, any questions? So you understand that separation in chromatography is based on the polarity and adsorption and how strongly your sample wants to interact with the stationary phase versus the mobile phase. In TLC, your stationary phase is a white coating or a thin layer of either um, silica, gel, or alumina. Um, it's a polar uh, surface. In column chromatography, you could use polar or non-polar um, column packing. In the uh, other one, in the gas chromatography, the mobile phase is going to be gas, but a stationary phase is a coating that is inside the coil that you have there. It's like a long uh, you know, tube that is the shape of the coil and is, is, is covered with the coating of a stationary phase. And then helium gas is trying to push the compound through and based on the based on the polarity and adsorption and how much they like to stick to the stationary phase or they like to move um, with the solvent is going to take time, different time, different uh, time in order to get to the other four ends of that coil uh, or the column is called uh, specifically uh, the column in chromatography. So you have the gas chromatography. So uh, if from the injection. To the receiving part it would be different time and that time is called retention time how long your sample stayed inside the column so retention time is different from one compound to another compound and because retention time is different you can if you know the retention time for a specific compound you can identify unknown by matching the numbers uh, for the column chromatography i you know, I, it's unfortunate that you don't have the opportunity to actually make the column. Um, just making the column it's by itself is an art here. So what you do, um, first, you have to follow the procedure. For TLC, we already talked about all the uh, pieces. And then for the column chromatography, you have your, uh, let me bring the, Search. Okay. For the column chromatography, there should be no gap when you have your column packing. There should be no gap because your sample is moving down and then along the, the column packing or the stationary phase uh, using a solvent. The column packing is going is like powder, but they are not stick together. It's not a solid piece. It's like a packed powder. That's how the solvent and everything, the mobile phase is passing through with the unknown, uh, with, the, with the sample. So can you tell me, especially if you have not answered any questions, I can go to the chat room and see who has not answered questions, but you can tell, you know it already. If you haven't answered a question, uh, what is the purpose of using glass wool when you are preparing column for the column chromatography? Use of glass wool. Craig, I think you answered questions. Antonia? Anam? And Maria, could you tell me what's the purpose of using glass wool? Filters the sample. Okay. 
filters the sample it's it, uh, remember it's that the no that's not the purpose in this case it could be glass would be used to filter the sample sure if you haven't answered the question you can you can you can answer but i think you either ask question or answer the question already but you could answer if you want what's the purpose of using glass wool for glass wool glass wool is just like cotton cotton ball do you think the glass wool right here at the end of the column is going to help the separation okay glass wool is actually blocking the sand is blocking the particles from the column packing that is right alexis uh the uh Yes, Mariah. So it would uh, it would prevent escaping or clogging this column because it's a very narrow opening here. You don't want sand or the column packing to get in there because if it gets in there, it blocks and the liquid doesn't move. Okay, we have the glass wool. Then we have the sand. We have two sands. One is one layer of sand is right over the glass wool and then another sand is right over the column packing what's the purpose of using sand over the glass wool elizabeth okay even bedding okay we want to have an even uh, foundation so the foundation of the column or column packing it should be level off there is no way that you can pack the glass wool into an even surface like imagine you have a cotton ball and you try to even it out is not going to is not going to stay even but when you are using the sand, the sand is heavy and it will put pressure over the glass wool and it's going to even out. So we, we will start with the even foundation. So that it's not tilted. Your, your column is not tilted. So it would be even foundation, starting with even foundation. Then you are going to add the column packing. Column packing is there is powder and you use proper solvent that the powder stays as powder it doesn't change to solid because if it changes to solid then uh, liquid is not going to pass through there is a layer of sand on top of the column packing and could you tell me what is that the purpose of the sand on top this sand here what's the purpose of the sand of the on top of the column packing Okay, Let's see who has not answered question yet. They job. prevent disturption of the stationary phase, disturbing the column. Okay. So when you when you add the column, like especially you're using a dropper, it's going to you, you're going to add it like by force and since those are I keep saying that column packing is powder it's not solid because it's loose powder it can be disturbed and you don't want to disturb it so the sand on the top layer it acts like a shock absorbent so it absorbs the force whereas you are pouring the liquid over and it does allow like a smooth transition of the liquid passing it through the column without being um, disturbed and uneven because if it's disturbed it's going to be uneven you want to even cut the top and the bottom of the um, column and uh, the two compounds that you are using for chromatography is fluorine and fluoranone 
the column packing is polar. The solvent, when you are using hexane as a solvent, which one would come leave the column first? Which one would travel faster? Fluorine or fluoronone? Which one is more polar, fluorine or fluoronone? What makes the molecule to be polar? Fluoronone is more polar. Fluorine is, okay, fluoronone is more polar. So which one would leave first? Which one would reach the bottom of the column first? Fluorine or fluoronone? That, this is the second question. The first one, we know that fluoronone is more polar. Now, which one would leave faster or move faster? Why fluorine would move faster? Because your solvent hexane is nonpolar, so fluorine likes the because it's less polar it likes the hexane more than the stationary phase the stationary phase is polar and fluorine has a choice to stay with the stationary phase or move with the solvent so because it looks like solvent is going to move faster when the fluorine leaves then you are trying to get the fluoronone leave and in order to get the fluoronone leave you have to bring acetone I'm sorry, acetone is a ketone, fluoronone is ketone. So then you bring like in like interaction. And because acetone is polar and fluoronone is polar, um, acetone is going to move the fluoronone uh, at the end. And fluoronone it has a yellow color. So it's very obvious to see that when you add the acetone, it's going to make a distinct band and it's going to move down as you pour the acetone over over the, uh, the column. The experience of being able to say if fluorine starts coming out or stops coming out, that's like, it's better to watch it than me talking about because even when students, they were in class, until they actually did the experiment, they didn't understand the concept. Like, how are you using watch class to say fluorine is coming out or not? But when you watch it, watch it carefully, it's very obvious and it's going to show that the, the residue is going to form or not. And it will, it, it's going to help you a lot understanding um, which one is coming out first or when it would stop coming out when the entire sample would leave the column. And uh, since I did not do the TLC after the column chromatography, uh, so you don't have numerical value for this, I want you to take a picture of the sample of the three flasks one is a waste container waste container should be colorless it should not have yellow color and then you have fluorine flask one and the fluoron known as the flask two flask two should be yellow color yes because hexane is nonpolar Fluorine is nonpolar. At the beginning, when you are using hexane, fluorine would move faster. And in order to move fluoronone, you cannot use hexane. You have to use more polar. So you are going to mix the hexane with acetone. First, that's more polar. And then when you, you know, when is uh, the, the band is like clearly, uh, formed for the yellow color, you would use the you would use acetone uh, to move it faster. Yes, like compounds attract each other. So the what is the like compound? So you have three compounds here. You have your 
uh, hexene, uh, fluorine, uh, fluoral, uh, fluorine, which is nonpolar. Hexane is nonpolar. And on the other side, the column packing is polar. The question is, would fluorine go with hexane and move fast? Or would stay with column packing and move slow? You have to think it that way. There's a competition. Would the sample go with the solvent or would it stay with the stationary phase? Going with solvent, that means it would move faster. Does it help? Yes, because of the polar packing. The column packing is polar. Yes. OK, questions? No questions? OK. We um, call for attendance. And if you have questions, of course, you would ask your questions. Um, Tarek? Uh, Ashley, I know is not here. Deja? No, no gas chromatography. We don't do the gas chromatography, Sam. Uh, Rosie? Ashana? Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Elizabeth, I said you were here. Jennifer? Alexis? Are you here? Okay. Alexis, Kylie, Kylie, um, Caleb, Valentina, Danielle. Mariah, Gatania, Anifo, Anna, Sammy, Cassandra. Craig and Antonia. Okay. Is there anyone who I didn't call name? I didn't call for attendance. No? Okay. 